take you back then to the fact that brain tissue requires very little oxygen indeed. The problems occur when the blood supply is re-established and the problems occur as a result of the damage from the free radicals formed on reperfusion. But as they say, no transport was visible if oxygen or oxygen and glucose were omitted. Um, so um, adding a physiological concentration of cortisol increased transport. That published in The Lancet in 1998, there was no correspondence. It's too uncomfortable. Now, since the meeting in 1999, I've kept a weather eye open for publications because surely somewhere we'll have found that this delayed onset is related to a perinatal birth injury, no matter how uncomfortable that is for us all in medicine, but particularly for the obstetricians and midwives. And eventually, as a result of a contact through the internet called David Friels, I came across from a pediatric neurology list this midbrain syndrome, which results in delayed onset dystonia but now it's due to perinatal or early childhood asphyxia. So, in spite of their name, the static encephalopathies of childhood show changes in neurological signs with time. In particular, the dyskinesia sometimes associated with these disorders can show striking evolution in character or severity. This phenomenon of delayed onset dystonia occurred following not only presumed birth injury, but also head injury and stroke. Now, what's the difference about this information? It comes from the neurologists. It's not me saying this. This is their observation. In the perinatal group, the mean age was 12.9 years. That's the onset of the dystonia that the neurologists are attributing to birth injury. Static? Among these patients, dystonia continues to progress for a mean of seven years and as long as 29, 28 years. Is there a window of opportunity for treatment when we can chart progression deterioration for 28 years? Of course there is. Well, this may not be too visible. I can barely see it from standing here, but of course it's backward projection. But these are the MRI Im images of a young, young man of four years old, the son of, a, of, a, of a, a doctor in France. When he was born, he was black. And this is an interesting story because there was some North African blood in the family. And the father, seeing this black infant born, thought, gosh, maybe this is a regression. But then I think he put that out of his mind because he realized that the infant was extremely cyanosed. And he said to the pediatrician, do you think we should give some more oxygen? Actually, I beg your pardon, it was to a midwife. Do you think we should give some oxygen? Oh, no, the child will be fine. And, of course, he isn't fine. He's got dystonias, delayed onset dystonia, and, of course, other problems as well. The MRI shows the damage in this posterior area, so he hasn't got traditional cerebral palsy. He's got dystonias, and it just simply w depends on which areas of the midbrain are damaged. Just to show you, this is an MS patient, and you can see the same areas are damaged around the ventricles, but this patient has no symptoms whatever at the moment. So, in fact, midbrain injury and these areas may be present in a lot of us. And on present MRI e evidence, given good resolution MRI, four out of 10 so-called normal people between the ages of 20 and 50 have little bits of damage in the midbrain. And what I would love to do if somebody was prepared to fund it would be to take an MRI into a major prison and look at the midbrain damage of the inmates. And it would be Aladdin's cave so many of these areas, autism, pathological personality, behavioral disturbance, dyslexia, we're talking about the processing of information in the midbrain. Well, finally, we all agree that we need to prevent this. 
And this relates to the most exotic development in imaging technology possible, where we can look at a volume of tissue in the brain and look at the chemicals present and find lactate. So what did they do? They used this in children who'd had a birth problem and found evidence of lactate sampling in several areas of the brain. What does it correlate? The more likely to, be se to die, the more likely to be severely disabled, the more likely to exist in a chronic persistent ve vegetative state if you find lactate. And that's sampling in three areas. So, the overall conclusion. Patients with elevated cerebral lactate are more likely to die acutely or at greater risk of serious long-term disability. Lack of oxygen. Lactate can only be present if there's insufficient oxygen to transfer its metabolism. So where's the future? The future is this most critical event has to be looked at. And where are we going to get the data? The only convincing data will come when we actually look in real time at what's happening. And we've the technology now to do that today. We can look at children after they're born. But of course, it's already been done. But we can also use, this is in fact a surgeon operating in a magnetic resonance imager. And using this technology, we can actually access in real time what's happening in the brain and then look at its reversal by giving more oxygen. Now, I have a Greek naval officer working in my unit at the moment. And the day before I left, he suddenly gave me a paper. And I was completely and utterly stunned. I didn't have time to make a slide, unfortunately. I would have loved to have done so. But I'll read it to you. Diagnostic and prognostic value of cerebral phosphates detecting using magnetic resonance spectroscopy in neonates with perinatal asphyxia. Most interesting thing is it doesn't correlate with APGAR scores. I'm sure it comes as no surprise to many people. But in this, what do they find? That the lack of oxygen affecting the production of the high energy phosphates can go on for weeks after birth. And in the paper, they actually show the graphs of an infant with this investigation one day after birth showing drastic reduction in the levels of the high energy phosphates, the three forms of ATP. And the same infant at seven days after birth, showing them beginning to rise. And then 35 days after birth, where they've assumed the normal cascade, the three are not at the same level. But I'll quote you. The scan looks qualitatively normal yet the respective brain metabolite concentrations were still severely pathologic. In other words, still severely subnormal. In other words, the hypoxia is persi persisting. And this is now 35 days after birth. Now, as we'll see in this conference, the basic stumbling block is that physicians think that if hemoglobin is saturated, that's the end of the matter. And what you will see is that which has become a clinical endpoint is not a real endpoint at all. In fact, you can live without hemoglobin. Life without blood was shown to be possible by the Dutch hyperbaric group under Pre Professor Borimer in 1959. They published the papers in the Dutch literature, the British literature, life without blood, because you don't need hemoglobin. But this is something that will be am amplified in the next few days. Thank you for your attention.